This week on Crossfeed. Why are you a Christian? What does Easter mean? Why are there so few men in church? Church versus the stripper pole. And Satan and the Vatican. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to CrossFeed Religious News. I'm Pastor Dale Critchley, pastor of Shepherd of the Ridge Lutheran Church in North Ridgeville, Ohio. I'm Pastor Jim Butler, out here in beautiful Dedham, Massachusetts, at St. Luke's Evangelical Lutheran Church. And it is good to be back now that Dale's hale and hearty, which he wasn't a couple weeks ago, and now that we're past Easter. Yeah. And we do hope you all had a very blessed Holy Week and Easter. Yeah, yeah, we were really hoping to do a uh, sort of, you know, just take Easter off and um, still record on Palm Sunday. Uh, but I just got hammered by a really nasty virus. And um, it was the first time. Okay. Except for the time I got my appendix out. All right. It was the first time that I have ever missed a Sunday morning service because of my health. Mm. So um, that, that was pretty major for me. I, boy, I called the elders up Sunday morning and said, you guys, <laughs> I need you to do the service this morning. <laughs> the comment I got back afterward was, well, it took four of us to, to do your job. <laughs> so so don't ever let this happen again. <laughs> so, only time I ever missed the Sunday service was when my son was born. So uh, fortunately, the senior pastor was able to take it because I had to get my wife to the hospital. Um but other than that, I've never missed a Sunday service. There have there was one time I had pneumonia, and I was running the fever about 102. Um, I still trying to figure out exactly how I made it through that service. Took a bunch of Tylenol before I left the house. I remember that. So the sort of fever was breaking, and yeah, well, but, there was uh, no way I was gonna. I mean, I I couldn't even stand up. So um, I, <laughs> it was I I felt bad. And I'm going. Uh, I've never missed a service. I, there's no. I've got to do this. <laughs> no, it's not happening. <laughs> so, when I went there. I thought he was going to say uh, he could barely put together a coherent sentence. But um, <laughs> that's <laughs> nobody would have noticed. So what can I tell you? Well, you know. Thankfully, I've been doing um, throughout Lent. I've been doing these um, sermons in the style of the screw tape letters. So normally, I just write out a very rough outline. I use a lot of sort of shorthand or abbreviations and things like that, so that most people are going to have a really hard time, you know, preaching from one of my outlines. But um, but because I've been doing these screw tape sermons, I actually had the whole manuscript written out, and so I could have one of the elders just read it. And it was it was all right there, and it just happened to work out that um, that I was I decided to include Palm Sunday in that sort of list of of, of uh, that series. So it just everything just sort of worked out to make it possible for me to you know to say hey I can't do it. Um, so and then this week after I mean Easter was awesome, and then after Easter I, I took the week out on vacation. We went down to Columbus um, and. Uh, you know, just spend some time with the family and, and, you know, it's, it's weird because I love my job. I, I absolutely love the ministry. Um, but you know, I love my family. And, uh, so it's like, I'm, I'm happy either way, but it's kind of weird being away from it for a week. Cause I know, you know, I can just, the things are piling up for me when I get back and stuff. So be jumping right into it tomorrow. Yeah. We, uh, it was a slow week for us, and uh, I'm taking next week off from vacation because I just need a break. And um, boy, I got, I've always taken the um, up here April uh, Mon- Monday's Patriots Day, which is the running of the Boston Marathon, and uh, so we're always closed down for that because it's always possible to drive in Boston. And then um, the rest of the week is uh, spring vacation week, and so um, I'm just taking it off as part of being spring vacation week hmm. uh but yeah it's been gorgeous we actually had 90 degrees this week we had a record high wow. uh spring is running about two weeks early up here well we've so, been uh, going back and forth so we go from record highs uh in fact what a couple weeks ago we were uh cleveland was the hottest city in um in the the country we were hmm. hotter than uh 
you know, Arizona and Florida and stuff. So, uh, but, but yeah, then we've had cold and now it's kind of evened out, fired up the grill this week and stuff. And it's pretty nice. Yeah, I've been, gr- I'm grilling about every night now. <sighs> oh, shoot. Thinking about firing up the grill, throwing at the barbie. Let's talk about Satan. <laughs> All right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. You know, I, I don't know. This is, this is kind of tough you when know. you got, um, when they're saying Satan in the Vatican, um, it's, uh, you know, sometimes have, have mentioned the, the Pope being, uh, the, the papacy, maybe I should say, um, being the Antichrist or, you know, things like that. Um, but here we have the chief exorcist of the Vatican who says, uh, his name is Father Gabriel Amorth, and he said that the devil is in the Vatican. Mm-hmm. Yes, the devil resides in the Vatican, and you can see the consequences. Of course, he also says people who are possessed by Satan vomit shards of glass and pieces of iron. So um, <clears throat> take this little bit of grain of salt. Uh, but um, I don't know. I say know, that he's been he, – okay, he's 85 years old, and he's been the – um, the Vatican's chief exorcist for 25 years. And the devil's in the Vatican. I say he's not doing his job. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, it's the devil himself. He's here. You're the exorcist. Get to work. You know, who are you going to yeah. call? <laughs> well, anyway, um, you know, so the evil influence of Satan was evident in the highest ranks of the Catholic hierarchy with cardinals who do not believe in Jesus and bishops who are linked to the demon. Well, I'm not sure about the bishops part, um, but, you know, the cardinals, you know, who don't believe in Jesus, yeah, that would be the influence of Satan within the, the work of the church. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, that is, uh, you know, to tempt to disbelief in things, especially those. Uh, uh, and we, we even talked about that a couple of weeks ago when we talked about the guy doing the research on the, you know, churches, the pastors who don't believe in God. Mm-hmm. Yep, that's right. Um He's also kind of trying to uh, tie in the, um, the all of the the scandals and everything that they've been having. Uh, he says the um, the assault on the Pope on Christmas Eve by a mentally unstable woman, the sex abuse scandals that have engulfed the Church in the U.S., Ireland, and Germany, proof that the Antichrist is waging a war against the Holy See. Um. You know, how much of that can you blame on the devil and how much of that can you blame on, you know, on your own policies and that? We don't generally get into all the abuse scandals of the Catholic Church and stuff. We tend to avoid those um, discussions. But um, <laughs> I don't know. It seems like a little bit of passing the buck there. I mean, it's certainly the devil's influence that, that's causing these things, but it's not just him. You know, we've got our own sinful flesh to deal with, too. Right. Well, I think there's also, though, at the same time, you can also talk about... Uh... Uh, I mean, it's kind of all of a sudden bounced back. I haven't quite followed, figured out, you know, I'm, I'm, if one of our readers knows why it suddenly bounced back, uh, you know, and, the, you know, now just the other day, of course, they found some letter from uh, the Pope that said, you know, uh, uh, you know, kind of covering up or something they said from the other day. I'm not even quite sure. I haven't had time to really follow up on everything that's going on there. But, you know, those attacks, you know, do get kind of blown out of proportion, not to excuse them. Mm-hmm. If there is any evidence that any bishop or any cardinal or archbishop or anybody deliberately covered up, uh, then that person should be gone. Mm-hmm. Um, but he does say, though, that uh, anything can come out of their mouths when you're possessed by the devil, uh, pieces of iron as long as the finger, or also wear rose petals. I puked. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, no, he, he says... Uh, um, he told uh, La Repubblica newspaper that the movie The Exorcist gave a substantially exact impression of what it was like to be possessed by the devil. Now, interestingly mm-hmm. enough, that I think I've mentioned before um, that that the, the 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 story that that movie was based on is actually based on a true story, but they I mean edited it quite a bit um, for the film. And, uh, and that the family, uh, was originally Missouri Synod Lutherans. Yes, they were. Um, but you won't find much talking about it. There's actually was an, uh, there's actually an STM thesis at the seminary, at the St. Louis Seminary 
yep. dealing with the topic of demon possession. And uh, in it, it's one of the few interviews that was ever held with any of the participants, uh, most of them who are long gone, but one of them was very wrinkled, uh, who was at the time, and he talked very little about it. Uh, so there, it's just there's not a whole lot of information about it out there. Yeah, there's I did but, there is a write up at the St. Louis Seminary about it that does go into some details. Um, and I've read it. It's it's I mean it's on the shelves, and uh, it, and, and yeah, it just it gives really strange details. I mean, this is one of those situations where they they tried to come up with an alternative. You know, okay, what's really causing this? And and it wasn't until they had absolutely, I mean, they used all kinds of instruments and things like that. And granted, this was in the 60s. We have better instrumentation now. But, I mean, there was just weird stuff going on that is. There's a lot of weird stuff going on in the 60s. <laughs> well, this is true. <laughs> all right. But, uh, I mean, you know, it was the, the kinds of things that you just can't explain easily, um, you know. With... Now, that describes most of the 60s. <laughs> Oh, groovy, baby. <laughs> um, the other thing is, though, however, he says he's convinced that all uh, the Nazis were all possessed. Um, and um, then the other thing that gets me is, is that he didn't like the Harry Potter books. Uh, they dabbled in the cult and failed to draw a clear distinction between the satanic art of black magic and benevolent white magic. I, I didn't know there was a, 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 a line there that was okay. Um, I read that, and I, I thought immediately of Luther's Second Commandment, you know, don't use God's name superstitiously or in satanic arts, whichever way you want to put that, but, you know, that there is no line between, you know, black magic and white magic. Okay, I was I read that, and I was trying to figure out what he was talking about, and the best I can figure out, you know, because, like, um, people who are into, like, you know, like Wicca and stuff like that, you'll sometimes hear talk about white magic or, you know, or something like that, um, but... You know, the only thing I could think of is where they're talking about, like, the sort of saints healing, you know, um, going in and the, um, some statue crying or, you know, and the tears heal or, you know, th that sort of, which, you know, we would chalk up to superstition, but, um, the, but, you know, at the same time, there were events like you've got, for instance, the Pool of Siloam in Jesus Day. Um, mm. where an angel would come and stir it up and somebody would go in there and be healed. Um, you know, so th there are these sort of miraculous things that do happen. Um, so if, if I guess I, I'm assuming that he's talking about that, that sort of, um, uh, you know, miracles. Uh, but yeah, white magic really makes it sound like, you know, are you a good witch or a bad witch? <laughs> Ding dong, the witch is dead. <laughs> but my question is, does Satan in inhabit stripper poles? Ah. Well, I'm sure he's definitely active there, especially given the name of the place. I'm, I'm sure you would know more than I. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no experience in that area. Uh, this is in <sighs> Renton, uh, in Washington. Washington State. Yeah. Um, and in this town, uh, uh, there, Sin, the club Sin Rock, uh, is the, um, place about to open, and it is the town's first strip club ever. Yep. And it is being challenged by Celebration Church. And, uh, they're, they're trying to put a stop to it. They're, they're picketing against it. Um, <clears throat> When we allow something like this in our city, we're basically saying women can be objectified. They're pieces of meat to be looked at. Um, yeah. <laughs> Isn't that pretty much how our culture sees women? <laughs> you know? you know, yeah, you know. Hard to argue with that. Um, you know, unfortunately, the Supreme Court has, you know, defined, you know, approves of lap dancing. That's a, that's a you know constitutionally protected under the First Amendment. Um, you know, oh, advertising, against, <laughs> advertising against the president is not. I mean, you know, that was... Well, no, that, they, they for, fortunately struck down uh, can, some of those weird uh, McCain-Feingold laws, but I haven't figured this out yet either. I guess maybe it's performance art. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I, you know what? I don't even want to talk about that. We've gone down that road before with the other things, and it never ends well. So. 
<laughs> I'm just trying to understand the reasoning, but uh, 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 but it says that they yeah they're prayer warriors. They are um, they're going to kind of it's in a it's a the zoned industrial zone place. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, you know, but it's but it's in an area that's changed over the decades with more offices and even daycare centers moving in. That's just what that's you want right cool. next to. Hey, they can go sure. on uh, on um, 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 field trips then. <laughs> I was thinking. I was thinking the, the the women can drop their kids off for daycare. You know, if you're right next to work. <laughs> it's just it's just wrong, no matter how you. Look at it. <laughs> yeah, that that it is. Um, I I was being sarcastic before, um, just for clarification. <laughs> um, right. But you know, it says here, you know, the city cannot ban strip clubs. It can restrict increase restrictions on where and how they operate. So the question is, all right, say say you've got a um a, a strip club coming into your city, all right, and uh, especially in this case where it's the first one, all right. If there's already a bunch there, then what's one more, right? But how do you as a church respond to this? You know, what do you what can you do about this? You know, you can you can try to keep it out, right? But They've already said, you know, they've they've done everything they could to do that, and it's it's a done deal. It's coming in, all right. So then, what do you do about it? Same thing we do every night, Pinky. Try to take over the world. <laughs> you know, <laughs> any ideas? Uh, you know, uh, I think there's a couple things. I mean, you you know, you could very you know very peacefully protest, uh, you know, and witness. Uh, you can stand out front and play classical music because that'll keep a lot of people running away. I've worked in churches for years. Uh, <laughs> you know, so. A little organ music. <laughs> Try, you know, you know, uh, um, you know, uh, you know, just just play some some Bach and Beethoven, you know, and, you know, out in the parking lot, you know, the, the, these guys will go, "What the heck is that?" You know, not well, not interest them to stand out there and hang around for too long. I remember in Springfield there was one uh, was a, there was a trip club that uh, wasn't too far from the church. It was right next to a door to a um, Chinese restaurant that I really liked, uh, and I just hated the place. And uh, finally, it shut down of its own accord. To just you know, the expense and stuff just got too much, and now it's a door and windows place. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll, yeah, I remember because you know all the windows were basically. Uh, um, Worked in and painted over and stuff, and it looked so nice when the you know, door window place went in there and you know cut, opened the windows back up and put actual windows in and you know repainted the place. It looked nice then for a change. <laughs> I mean, the places are just seedy on the outside, you know. It's just mm-hmm. very, very representation on the outside. What's going on inside? Yeah, pretty much. Um, <clears throat> so you know, th- I guess the thing that you know th- th- what kind of message can you can you send um you know you definitely i would say you definitely want to communicate with your church and say look this is not acceptable um this is not a god pleasing uh way to to treat people or or you know um guys if your wives don't want you to go there there's a reason for that you know um and you know the other thing that I think of, every time I see this kind of stuff, I just think you know what that's somebody's daughter, you know, and and it's like guys, how would you like it if your daughter were here and and you know acting like this and and behaving like this and 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 having people look at your daughter like that, you know? For me, that's that's it right there, you know. <laughs> I, just, I, have, I have no interest in porn just because I know that's somebody's daughter, you know? right? Every once in a while, I do wonder about that. You know how you know how, how do you you know what, you know must be some interesting conversations some people have. Um, you know, like yeah, dear, we 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 saw your spread. Gee, that. that. <laughs> Where does the conversation go from there? Yeah. You know, I mean, you know, it's just it's just yeah, that it, it is. You know, I often think as somebody's daughter, this is, this is someone, you know. Ultimately, someone for whom Christ died. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and that's, and, the, and that's the, the biggest thing. Like, people get angry about all this stuff, but ultimately, it's it's just so sad. 
You know, the the people they're just they're they're settling for this this cheap, meaningless, you know, thing that is just so <clears throat> so much less than what mm. God offers us. And you know, some of the people there, you know, they they talked about you know it's the objectification of of, being, of women. Women do become objects in this case. I mean, some of the some of the comments that were pretty sad, you know. I mean, it's, it's really, it's, 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 I was like, well, I like looking at naked women. Well, I got news for you, guy. Um, you just, you know, you're turning into objects of, 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 you know, just objects then. You know, it's, it's the person who said that is, you know, you're, you're proving her point. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, of course, my other one was, you know, well, churches got plenty of problems, too. They shouldn't be telling us what to do. Well, you know what? Yeah, what the churches do. You know, you know it goes back to our problems there and, you know, the Vatican and some other stuff. Or, Nobody's saying perfection, but there is, you know, and, and number two, I, I said is, what, 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 what did Celebration Church do that was wrong? What did their pastor do that was wrong? Yeah, because they didn't talk about the other church; just talks about him. So, mm-hmm. oh well, we don't know anything about him. But we're gonna smear him with other people who may be completely unrelated to him. Nothing <laughs> yeah. with that. Yes, yeah, so we all do the same. So. But you know, a strip club at the church may help gain men. <laughs> Oh yeah, there you go. So is that your new uh your new men's ministry right there, Jim? <laughs> no, no, but I thought you might like to follow up on it. <laughs> yeah, you got the rock and roll hall of fame out there, you know. You would fit right in. <laughs> Sex, drugs, rock and roll, you know, all goes together. Yeah, that's that's our new uh church slogan. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we always, always talk about oh. how the, the, the three things that the Lutherans debate about is wine, women, and song. So, you know, it just, it all just fits right in. <laughs> okay, you people who are members of Dale's Church listening to this, you may want to ask him about this. His new outreach. <laughs> all right. Um, there goes our clean label again, I tell you. Anyway, um, our clean label never lasts. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Not with you, anyhow. Yeah, yeah, it's all my fault. Mm. Okay. If you go to the average church, you'll notice that about 60% or more of the people there are women. And, um, and in some places, in some, in some denominations, in some places of the world, it's even higher. Um, <clears throat> the question is, how do we bring men back into the church? Uh, even Lutheran Hour Ministries has asked this question. Uh, you got the, I, you know, they sent out a DVD uh, a while back called uh, the Men's Network. You know, yeah. uh, because there is a, a this huge lack of men in the church. Yeah, it, you know, it, I think one of the things they emphasize in this article is um, that there's a lot of emphasis right now in churches on uh, having a close personal relationship with Jesus, which that, you know, close personal relationship stuff, uh, tends to appeal to women. It's a sort of touchy feely kind of, um, imagery. And, um, you know, with, with men, men respond more to the concept of power, you know? And so, uh, so they've got talking about different churches and, and trying to use more of this sort of power, uh, imagery and, um, in fact, they, they mentioned Jim's new, uh, uh, program. Um, they, services start on a recent Sunday with a blare of trumpets that led to the theme song from the movie Superman. Uh, on two huge screens, movie clips showed the Cape Tiro crashing through walls and hurtling through the air. The stage was decked out to look like the planet Krypton. So, that sounds kind of like your thing, doesn't it, Jim? That sounds a little scary to me. Um, even I wouldn't go that far. <laughs> um, yeah, but I did. They did talk about one sermon that identified uh, Superman and Samson together somehow. Um, but yeah, it, 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 you know. But there is this picture there. But you know, how can we touch men's lives? Now it's interesting. One church here, um, I just drove by today, had a uh, an annual blessing of the bikes. 
And so they have a, a, a thing for motorcycle riders and the pastors motor, is, is in the motorcycles. So they go out and they, he'll ride, they have this blessing of the bikes and they go out and ride motorcycles together. Mm-hmm. Um, the interesting thing to me is how many of the people in this magazine, in this article are, that they interviewed, um, are, are Catholic. Yeah. You know, that, you know, the, a lot of the Catholics are, interesting to me was the guy who was, he was uh, a Catholic, he kind of drifted away, went to non, non-denominational churches, and then went back into Catholicism again. He, he found the, the stuff, he, he, he likes the ritual and stuff, but he, he wants uh, to build a stronger men's ministry. Yep. Yeah, and this is Detroit Free Press, so it's not like it's a, you know, Catholic uh, church, you know, right. paper or something. So, yeah, and they talk about the decor. They said the inside of churches often looks like grandma's parlor dressed up with flowers, boxes of Kleenex, and lace. It's, it's true. <laughs> it's true. And you know what the thing is? You look at the imagery in the Bible, there's none of that. I mean, the, you've got some of the sort of Rose of Sharon and Lily of the Valley and, and that kind of stuff, right? But so much of the Bible is is, is blood and steel. Well, not steel. They didn't have steel, but, you know, iron and... And stuff like that. Yes, but we but we know that the temple in Jerusalem looked like the planet Krypton. I mean, you know, let's get serious here, folks. Um, no, I mean there there is a richness to this, um, but I think that's you know I think that, you know they're, they're, I think personally that's a good influence of women that they realize that this this isn't just a building. You know, this is a worship place. This is a, a place where one does have, have a relationship with God. I mean, that's you know, uh, we're, we're talking in my my confirmation class now. Uh, um, last stuff with eighth graders, and one thing I want to cover one more time is Christian attitudes with sex. And last son, last week, I talked about differences between men and women. And one of the things I talked about is, you know, uh, you know what, how guys' house and stuff would look. You know that it's, you know, guys see it's very utilitarian. It's a place to, you know, change your socks, take a shower. And women, I said, I, I said, girls, what is a house? And they said, it's your home. That's where you grow a family. And the guys are like, oh, well, yeah. Uh, you know, there's that too. Uh, you know, I said, but that's, that's the nature of the place. Uh, and, uh, I, so I think that's important. But I think, I think, you know, I, I, I think there's a need to bring in men's ministry. I think it's kind of funny because on one hand, um, they're talking about, oh, no, none of this guy's really like this touchy feely stuff. And they don't know him like this stuff about relationship, yada, yada. But at the same time, you know, they encourage to form small men's groups so they can con- connect on a regular basis with other men. Building relationships. Building relationships, people. <clears throat> so, I mean, this is the big question, though, is, is what do you do? You know, th- is it is it the sort of power focus, which which is kind of tricky because when you talk about the power of God where it's, you know, we see it manifested on the cross where Jesus he lays down his life and it has power over life and death, you know. Wait a minute. <laughs> God's power is in weakness, you know. <laughs> like, oh, that, that just throws everything. <laughs> you, know? Um, you know, so, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm not sure what the answer is here. Um I get a little nervous about, well, we're going to try this program or, or that, you know, and we'll do this emphasis or, or whatever. And, you know, and the problem is you're going to, if you totally put your emphasis on power, then you're going to alienate the women. Pretty soon you got nobody coming, you know? <laughs> and, you know, so, you know, you could do these, these men's, you know, well, we've got these retreats and all that kind of stuff. Okay. But who's the people that are going to go on those retreats for the most part? the guys that are already involved, you know, maybe you can, you know, have some women sort of coerce their husbands into going to these things or something. And then, you know, there's an example of a guy in this article where he went to one of these things and it it really changed his life, you know, but quite often that's not where it's going to happen. Um, so, you know, I, I'm not sure this is something that, that I've thought about and and I'm not sure what the answer is here. Uh, well, I think one key thing, though, is, is to be careful not to give too many roles over to, to women. Um, okay, they did, but the one guy gripes about, uh, uh, you know, boys doing, uh, girls being altar servers at the Catholic Church, and, you know, guys don't want to be seeing what the girls are doing. Well, no, that's not, I mean, we've had girls, 
lighting candles, acolyting in every one of my churches. None of the guys have learned. I've never heard a guy say, I don't want to do it if the girls are doing it. Yeah, they're all glad to help out, you know, and I'll talk about this is this is the way you guys serve God. This is the way you can serve him. Uh, on the other hand, it says the Episcopal Church uh, has, you know, a female head and promotes gender equality and has the highest percentage of churches with a significant lack of male attendance. Um, and uh, I, I just wonder how true that is. I mean, I've often said, you know, women tend to be more religious by men. I think, you know, one of the reasons, you know, we in the Missouri Senate don't ordain women. And I often think one of the reasons, you know, God set it up that way, we, we don't because we believe God set it up that way. One of the reasons I think God set it up that way is that men tend to resonate better to a male doing the preaching. Uh, women, I don't know if they necessarily resonate more if a woman preaches, but I think, you know, if, if men resonate more, and I think, you know, and, you know, study after study has shown that in a household, if the, if the father is active in a church, that tends to be more influential. Right. Yeah. So. And so, and that I think is why this whole, you know, looking at this issue is so important is, all right, if women, moms take their kids to church, you know, it's got sort of a 50-50 effect, okay? Um, it, it might help, but it might not. If dad is there and takes the kids to church, all right, that's huge. That has a, statistically has a tremendous influence on the kids, even if mom doesn't go. Right. And um, Actually, it... It, you're wrong. It's not a 50-50 of just mom and not dad. It's actually more 80-20. Only about 20% of the people uh, who, 20% of the kids who are involved in church with just their moms will continue after they become young adults themselves. Okay. What, uh, what I meant by 50-50 really, was compared to whether they go like with no parents right. or, or something like that. Right. But if they, uh, after, if they go with no parents... It's, there's a 15% chance that they actually will be involved. It's not that much of a drop-off. The drop-off is whether the dad is in, involved or not. That's the drop-off. Right. Yeah. So, dads, it's, it's you are so important. All right? And and, and, right. and for the women that are listening to this and, and watching this, if your husband doesn't go to church, talk to him. Make sure that he understands, you know, the influence that, that his actions have. And, you know, yeah. it's, it's kind of tough. It's kind of harsh. But you know what? It's just the way it is. You know, kids look up to their dads, and dads can say, this is important, this is important. But you know what? If dad doesn't show them that it's important, well, you know, the kids, they're not dumb. This isn't important to dad. You know, if if it were important, he'd go. You know, unless he's got a really good reason, um, you know, he's disabled and the church isn't handicap accessible or something like that. You know, it's it's going to have a huge impact. Right. I, I I'm always I'm always whenever I do a baptism, I'm always on the dads. But you're you're the key in this kid's family and the kid's spiritual life. <sighs> Beat a few of them in the head, but that's beside the point. Um, well, uh, that brings up the good question, though: is why are you Christian? What is the most single influential thing? And this, it's nice to know that stuff that has been talked about since. The 1970s has been rediscovered to still be true. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And so the most got... important thing is relationships. Yep. <laughs> Back to relationships again. <laughs> All right. But not necessarily touchy feely relationships. Um, this is uh, Pastor Sean Anderson of the Church of Christ. Um, he wrote a book called Living Dangerously, which analyzes the factors affecting conversions to Christianity. And so he's not talking about like, well, is it the Holy Spirit or, you know, or whatever. But he's looking at, you know, just statistically what what really connects people, what gets people, um, you know, what causes people to become involved in Christianity. So he surveyed 1,500 uh, men and women who had recently become Christians, and he um, he asked them, uh, he wanted to test two assumptions about sharing the gospel, personal relationships and the character of the person, all right? So um, he said, according to his hunch, he found that 70% of those surveyed, it was a specific person who had led them to faith, a friend or family member rather than a pastor or door knocker or televangelist. 
Right? Mm-hmm. And the one moral characteristic that stood out for the recently converted was that the person had been loving. Oh, gee, that's just like Jesus said. <laughs> Love your neighbor as yourself. Huh. Go fig. Right. <laughs> Yeah, I said the old model of conversion, which replicates uh, sales theory of giving a prepared speech, overcomes the uh, target's misgiving, has outlasts its useful life. Uh, you know, the funny thing is, I, I mean, I graduated 25 years ago, you know. Um, yeah, 25 years ago next month. Um, you know, I've been in this, you know, being January is my 25th anniversary, or my 25th anniversary of my ordination. I was, I've never heard. Do I use a targeted, use a prepared speech to overcome and overcome the person's misgivings? It's always been about developing a, a relationship with somebody and showing that person unconditional care and love, and you love them to the kingdom of God right. as you share the gospel with them. And you got to be real about it. You cannot go out there and, and sort of specifically target people because um, you know you're sort of seeing them as little notches in your belt. Okay. Just go out there and love the people in your life, all right? right? And show them that you care about them, not because you, I mean, yes, you want them to become Christians, okay? But not. it's not that I'm going to love you because I want you to be a Christian, all right? But I want you to be a Christian because I love you. Right. All right? And, and well, that's says, the difference. Yeah. yeah, he says Christians meet new people and allows relationships to build. Um we actually have a really cool church. I don't know if the men, that these men guys here would like the name of this church that uh, just started out here, our, our, our new mission, but Connecting Point Lutheran Church. And um, it, and that's the emphasis. It's really on small group relationships in this church. Uh, and the idea being that uh, it would be a connecting point for people where they can be connected to God. That's cool. Yeah. And uh, that's... You know, so so look at the emphasis here, people. All right, seventy percent, not because of pastors. All right, so if you say that evangelism is the pastor's job, nope, I don't think so. Hmm. All right. In fact, how how do most place people look at the pastor? They look at him as 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 the salesperson. Right. Yeah. You know, I mean, I, you know, I, I was just talking with. Um, we have to have this couple visiting. And uh, they're in their, in their early 30s, have a little girl, cutest little thing. Uh, matter of fact, uh, her uh, one of her previous pastors was a classmate of mine. Neat people. But they don't have any relationships in the church. How do we build those relationships for them? You know, as opposed to somebody else who came in the congregation. And his, you know, it, you know his wife had been a member for years. Uh, she grew up in the church. And then, um, you know, he's been kind of drifting and then he, uh, started coming with her and went to adult instruction and joined a year ago. Well, my goodness. I mean, he comes, she comes and he, he comes in with, you know, built in relationships. Right. Yeah. Uh, all these people who, who know her, you know, bring him in. Right. Right. Uh, and so if people invite their friends, you know, their coworkers, their friends, their, you know, uh, other family members who aren't involved in church and, and, um, and, and, you know, then they've got you as a connection, all right? And then you can help them get to know other people, all right? Someone just coming in off the street, that's a, that's a pretty scary thing, you know? And, uh, and... Especially if Dale's being the preacher. I mean, that is a scary thing to walk in there, man, I'll tell you. This big old hulking guy, six foot four, you know, leaning over you, looking at you, you know? Dressed as a ninja. So, <laughs> so, so yeah, I mean, so, I mean, just, just think about this and, you know, pastors, I, I'm sure you're already communicating this to your congregation, but here's a statistic for you, you know, is let people know this. And, and I did not know that. So, you know, easy ways to invite them to church, but you know, some people aren't comfortable going to church, but you know, evangelism is not just inviting people to church either. All right. Evangelism is, is is sharing this love with people, all right, and and just letting them know who you are that that you're a Christian, and they see this love going on in your life, and the way that that you treat them, and and the way that you treat other people and stuff, and you know what, and by knowing that you're a Christian and seeing this, you know, the way that it, it 
reflects in your life, they're going to go, huh, isn't that something? Right. Maybe there's something to this. Or maybe they'll think you're vegetarian. <laughs> that could be too. No, that's an old joke. Is the guy said, I'm just going to live, in my, live it out in my life. And some guy comes up, I see this peace about you. I see this comfort about you. I, I see this real happiness in your life. I was wondering, are you vegetarian? And I'll, somewhere along the line, we've got to make, you know, the, 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 the word there. And that's where I think sometimes it's really a good thing to, 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 you know, if you feel like you can't do it, you know, to invite somebody to go to church with you. Um, statistically, they say people are very open to that if they're asked. Yeah. Uh, which brings us, us up actually to our last uh, thing because it talks about uh, what is the purpose of Easter? What is Easter all about? And one of the comments in this particular article was that uh, how willing people are to invite people, non you know, church, non church friends to go to Easter with them. Yep. And I've got to say, last week, my goodness, we had one, two, we had a ton of visitors last week for, for Easter Sunday. Um, and a lot of them had been invited by other people in the congregation. Cool. Uh, every year we make a big push for Christmas and Easter to invite your people, friends of yours who don't go to church because that's a time when if, if you were raised in it all religiously or you just wonder, gee, you, you might be open to going, even if you don't know what Easter is all about, which apparently some people don't. Yeah. They right. really do think it's chocolate bunnies. <laughs> Actually, there weren't that many people connected with the whole chocolate bunnies thing. I was surprised with that. All right. So this is uh, what another Barna survey. And um, yeah. so only 42% of Americans linked Easter to the Christian faith's belief in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. All right. Now, so the question was, uh, the study asked how many adults are willing. To, oh, wait, no, I'm sorry. Um, asked a, a sample of American adults to describe what Easter means to them personally. All right. And so 42% said something about the resurrection of Jesus. All right, less than half. Now, okay, some of the other, um, let's see, uh, 2% said Easter was about the birth of Christ. Those are your Christmas Easter people. You know, they only go to church twice a, twice a year, and, you know, that's all they ever talk about is resurrection, birth of Christ is one of the two, you know. Um, uh, another two percent said it was the rebirth of Jesus. I don't know. I'd probably link that in with resurrection, depending. Yeah, on... I, yeah. I think they probably just messed up what they were saying. Yeah. Um, and one uh, percent said it was a celebration of the second coming of Christ. You know, I can see that too because I think about what is what does Easter mean to me? Right. Yes, it's a celebration of Jesus crucif or Jesus resurrection. At the same time, it what it means to me is that. I'm going to rise one day too. <laughs> All right. right. So, I, you know, depending what they meant by the second coming of Christ, it, I mean, those two are, are completely linked, you know. No. Of course, if they Among the non religious, like, among the non religious, 13% said they didn't know really how to describe it. Um, 8% said they don't celebrate it because it doesn't mean anything to them. Um, some say getting friends and family together. Now, time to go out there. Uh, spring break. Well, it's a little late turn for spring break, actually. Um, Not for us. Uh, a, okay, a symbol of new. Okay, our symbol of new beginnings, rebirth, renewal. That I can see. That makes a lot of sense. That, that that's really the ch little chicks, and that's the you know the bunnies, and that's that really is kind of that that theme in there. Um, a time to die and hide eggs. <laughs> a time for children to have fun. The Easter bunny. Um, and an opportunity, yeah, and uh, an, uh, an opportunity to enjoy food and candy, one percent. But if you, but if you take all that kind of together, uh, you know, the the, the eggs, uh, kids, bunny, that that all gets kind of tied together. So yeah, you know, it's kind of about six percent that whole group put together. Mm -hmm. And probably you could throw in the ones about family and friends too, and into that. Um, you know, because that, that, that all kind of goes together. Yeah, we get the kids together, we give them candy, we, you know, that all kind of goes together. Right. Yeah. So, but, you know, what this does say is that I think a lot of Christians just assume that everybody knows what Christmas is all about 
everybody knows what Easter's all about. You know, Christmas, everybody's watched Charlie Brown and, you know, and Linus given the Christmas story. All right. So everybody ought to know what that's about. And Easter, you know, um, they watched it's the Easter Beagle, Charlie Brown. So they should know what that is. (laughs) We watched it again this year, but it never actually mentions Jesus. So, um, but, uh, you know, that like people just assume that, that, oh, well, everybody, you know, you ever notice all this sort of keep Christ in Christmas stuff? You never hear keep Christ in Easter, <laughs> which I don't know if, if you're going to make us think about it. Isn't that one more important? <laughs> I don't know. Just, just saying. Um, oh, would you please just give your Christmas message to the nice people of Great but, Britain? But the point is that people don't necessarily know. All right. And and even if they do, okay, that's when Christians believe that Jesus rose from the dead. So what? You know, because I know people that that say, yeah, I believe that that happened, but it's sort of as a historical anecdote and uh, interesting story. But what does it mean? Uh, it means that since Jesus died, he conquered death. Because Jesus rose again, we have the assurance of eternal life, not just clouds and and you know, fluffy walking around with harps or something like that, like you see on TV, all right? But real life, you know, eternal life with Jesus. And, you know, with, with all those who've died in the faith. And 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 it's, it's not, it, you know, it's a huge deal. But if, but so many people just don't even know what it's about. Well, there's always the congregationalist guy who told me that his message for Easter this year was going to be how you have hope when there is no more hope left. Just a fool's hope. Oh, yeah, that's how you good. go on. You know, how you go on when there's nothing else in life to go on for. Because the resurrection? Well, no, that's not it. No, because Jesus may not have really risen. It's, yeah, just how you go on when there's no hope left. Oh. <laughs> but that's how. <laughs> <laughs> it, I mean, you know, and that's the thing. That's the message that we have is right. that, you know, and, I, and I've, I've been saying this a lot lately, that we as Christians can say it's going to be okay no matter what. Even in the face of death, we can say it's going to be okay because we have the promise of the resurrection. You know, and and so we've we've got this assurance that nobody else has. And, I mean, it's just, it's just, it's huge. It, it's the answer to every problem. I mean, ultimate answer, if, if there's no other answer that comes along first, you know? And so a lot of people, they don't even know the answers there. I mean, not even, a, it's not even a matter of, um, of, oh, well, I've heard it and, and I reject it, all right? They haven't even heard it. Mm-hmm. That is a sad thing. Thoughts, comments from anybody out there in podcast land? Yeah, we haven't been able to. We haven't heard from anybody in a couple of weeks. Um, any of you think about? Oh, a couple. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. Go Actually, ahead. in fact, um, that story that we just did on the Vatican and, and the exorcism yep. that was actually sent to us by Carlos um, up in Canada. And uh, I'll tell you, he said that he was having a hard time logging in, so he just sent it to me um, via email. And I'll tell you, what, here's the thing: we've um, we've sort of automated CrossfeedNews.com, and um, so in fact, you'll see like duplicate stories and stuff like that, and and some stories like you'll see like Charlotte Church or something like that, you know, once in a while, just because it flags church, right? So the whole system's been sort of automated, and it, it needs to be cleaned up a little bit, but I just haven't had a chance to do that. So, um, are you frozen again? No, oh. I'm just sitting here quietly. <laughs> you weren't blinking. <laughs> uh, I'm just being quiet and a good boy. That's all. Okay. Um, so, you know, if you find something interesting, this is a special offer for our, um, our viewers and listeners. If you see a story that, that you find interesting that you think would be a good one to cover, um, on our show, just send it to us podcast at crossfeednews.com. Just send us the link. Okay. And, um, and, and those will get top priority. Now, 
obviously there's there's certain articles we're not going to do, or if it's a topic that we've really spent a lot of time on lately, you know, maybe we won't, but we'll definitely consider that as a, you know, sort of, um, it'll be at the, the top of our list of shows to consider or of stories to consider. Mm. Um, so yeah, just email podcast at crossfeednews.com, which is, this is, and that's what Carlos did. And, um, so he he sent me this link and he he said I found the story interesting regarding the details of demon possession and exorcism. I don't belittle Father uh, Amorth statements and I don't think that he's exaggerating. They match several first-hand accounts that I heard about demon possession in Brazil, where I'm from. On the other hand, I don't think that he can explain away the institutional cover-ups of criminal priests by blaming it all on the devil. <laughs> all right. And that's pretty much, you know, what we said when we were, I was, I was going to um, bring this up when we were discussing the article and, and I just forgot to, even though it was sitting right here in front of my face. So um, sorry I didn't do it then, but Carlos, thanks for that link. And it was a great story. I'm, I'm glad that you um, brought it to our attention. So I uh, really enjoyed doing that one. Um, so, and then I also got uh, feedback from Jason from my church and, uh, and he said that guy complaining about having to take off his hood is the the Jedi, um, is just silly. But it did remind me of an issue about two or three years ago about an Arab woman who was forced to take off her veil for a driver's license. The purpose of an ID is to identify oneself, and that can't be done through a veil. Yes, we should be respectful of, of other cultural practices, but within reason. All right, and yeah, I mean that's the whole thing. There's that whole balance between security and and yeah, if if it's a picture ID. You know, the whole point is to actually have a picture of the person, um, you know. And so in this case where, you know, you go into banks and stuff like that, you know, they say no head covering. You know, if, even if I'm wearing a baseball cap, I have to take it off when I walk into the bank. And um, so, yeah, same kind of deal. Um, he says, I've been listening to the show more often, especially on the drive to work, and the audio has indeed gone way up. I tried to listen to show 23 and my and my iPod tried to kill me through the speakers of my car. <laughs> our our yeah, our older episodes, uh, you know, they're out there, but boy, anybody that's listening to them, do so at your own risk. <laughs> We've learned a lot about audio and video through the years and you know, show 23, that was that was back when we were still when I was still on dial-up. <laughs> And, uh, that was before we have a, a little app that I use called the levelator, um, that evens out the volumes of things. <laughs> Didn't have that before. And, you know, um, uh, it really makes a huge difference. So, um, uh, so yeah, the, those old shows are there and I think they're, they're probably an interesting time capsule. You know, after we're doing the show for like 10 years, you can go back and see how much older Jim looks. <laughs> I'm not old. So hey, this 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 December, I hit fifty. Yep, and we're so. very thankful that Jim puts his teeth in, you know, for the show. So <laughs> sorry about this. I know it's a bit silly. So watch it, child. <laughs> Don't forget, old age and treachery will beat youth and inexperience every time. <laughs> Do not hesitate. Mercy. You keep working. You're paying my social security. So I remember that. <laughs> when you retire, there won't be anything left. No, you. there won't. It's supposed to run out like two gone. years before I retire. <laughs> anyway, folks, we better end this thing. But uh, any other comments, any other thoughts are always welcome at G- Crossfeed, podcast at crossfeednews.com. Um, and uh, with that, God give you a blessed continuing Easter. And we will see you next week. He is risen. Yes, he is. Sure enough. (laughs) Good night, everybody. God bless you.